Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wo Xiao, as I introduced in um, um, Slack, and I will be your first uh, instructor for the day, uh, focusing on just give you a hopefully a gentle introduction to the workshop materials I will be uh, going over the rest of the week. And welcome. So first to remind you again that all the material is uh, covered under CC by SA uh, licensing, which means you can free to share and adopt for your own use, but you uh, should uh, attribute and share the material you, you adopt and use. And hopefully uh, even after the workshop, you can still come back and refer to these material, uh, to these slides and to the, uh, the content of the workshop if necessary. Okay. So uh, this is by far the most ambitious workshop I think we're doing for this uh, particular topic. And it started off with a three, uh, in 2017 as I believe three and a half day workshop and with uh, six modules or so plus a, a a uh, guest lecture uh, or a, um, a keynote speak speaker. And uh, over the years, we gradually expanded the workshop. And as you saw on the website, it's still listed as a four-day workshop last year. And this year, we finally decided we might as well fill in the, the rest of the week and make it a five-day workshop and also uh, in uh, have a, a integrated assignment, but actually because each day is shorter, so to hopefully have you uh, have uh, enough time for you to work on the assignments. So uh, the there are ten modules, as I mentioned. Uh, you're we're in module one, which is introduction to genomic epidemiology, and then uh, as you'll see, I color coded these modules. Uh, the first four, you can consider them as a bit of um, a more foundational material. So we'll look at uh, de novo genomic assembly annotation. We mainly focus on bacterial genomes, uh, but uh, it just gives you an overall sense of how we deal with sequence data. And in the third module, which we started to offer this and, and had great feedback uh, last year, was on data curation and data sharing. And I'll touch on that in my own uh, lecture a little bit as well. And then we we'll also will be cover phylogenetic analysis. And then uh, initially this workshop actually started mostly as a bacterial pathogen genomic analysis, but over the years, we gradually introduced more viral genomic analysis content. So this year you see there are both a phylogenetic, um, a phylodynamic analysis offered by Finn, but also uh, a session specific on viral pathogen genomic analysis uh, with Jared. But we still continue to offer a topic on bacterial pathogen genomic analysis, especially focusing on when you have the whole genome, the gene content variation um, or allelic variations, and also uh, a topic that's important in microbiology, which is antimicrobial resistance and how we can analyze these resistant genes. And that will be with Andrew. Um, and then we have two additional topics that again, uh, connect uh, many of the, the ideas together. One is on mobile genetic elements. And as you'll see how these genetic elements play a key role in pathogen evolution and in bacterial and evolution in general. And then we'll finish off the workshop with a session on emergent pathogen detection and identification, giving you a better sense that can we go beyond just uh, genomic sequencing of isolates and uh, start taking a more metagenomics approach to understand uh, the pathogen populations. And as mentioned, we'll anchor some of these material with an integrated assignment that you can work on to get a more in-depth understanding of the topic, uh, the topics, I should say. 
So the general learning objective for this workshop is that hopefully you'll understand how genomic epidemiology can improve clinical and public health microbiology, uh, and actually with more and more uh, of you coming from animal health and from uh, sort of generally the, the environmental health and one health type of concept, really this workshop also apply beyond just human health and and extending the same concept and ideas to animal and environmental health. And we also uh, will show you how to process genomic data using variety of biomimic tools for bacterial and viral genomic and metagenomics approaches. And these are the type of activities you'll try out in the um, hands-on sessions. And we'll also describe how you can interpret genomic data in different epidemiology contexts and understand the importance of data standardization and sharing and the need to do so in order to really address this uh, wicked challenge of uh, infectious disease uh, outbreak. Uh, you'll have an opportunity, as I mentioned, to perform several types of genomic epidemiology analysis. And then uh, through the process, you'll recognize the limitation and challenges of the current approaches. And as this is a rapidly evolving field, uh, we indeed try to add more up-to-date content each year, but also trying to give you a very good sense of the, fun um, the fundamental um, uh, process for data analysis. Uh, so, and that, that explains why the, the workshop getting keep getting bigger. And one of the questions that we have, and maybe for you to think about as a participant, is whether this is more suitable as uh, two separate shorter workshops, and if so, how you would like to see the material divided, and if we can hopefully towards the end of the workshop, have a bit of a discussion on Slack about that. That will really help us to um, reject the content for next year. Okay, so back to the learning objective for module one. Uh, the most important uh, objective of, of module one is really just to give you a sense of the uh, why we can use genomic epidemiology studies to achieve better results than the more traditional symptom or even marker gene based approaches. And so to do so, we would first want to introduce why infectious disease research is important. And the fact that you're all here, I think you that's probably preaching to the choir a little bit. But I'll give you some examples of genomic epidemiology studies to show how uh, people are doing it just at a very uh, superficial level, but you'll get into it a lot more in the rest of the, the workshop. And be familiar with also high throughput sequencing and its applications to clinical and public health microbiology. And actually, in the previous years, I covered a bit more of the sequence data processing steps and also a little bit more about data uh, standardization using ontology development, uh, but that we have actually uh, see the uh, the critical nature of these topics. So we moved into zone modules in module two and module three, and uh, shortened this introduction a little bit just to give you a, a taste of it. But feel free actually to um, and I'll uh, make sure I have Slack on my screen. Um, so that if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand or uh, in Zoom or in Slack to um, to ask your questions. Okay, so I, I usually like to start our discussion with a fly map. And this is a picture showing the fly path of commercial air travels and path of, and the idea is that pathogens can spread around the world very quickly with the transportation of human, animal, and goods. And I think we all lived through that experience uh, when COVID uh, unfolded. And it's also interesting to see that, you know, just a month after the declaration of, of the pandemic, the number of flight 
this is showing the number of flights in the sky uh, indeed drastically reduced, especially uh, the ones uh, intercontinental travels reduced uh, significantly. Um, so it highlights our the 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 close nature between you know our human activities and infectious diseases. So case to point here is a study by some Danish group researchers a few quite a few years ago, almost a decade ago, looking at mic micro found in airplane toilets, and they filtered human waste from eighteen different flights. Uh, from three parts of, coming into Denmark from three parts of the world and extracted DNA for shotgun sequencing. So then they clustered the samples based on the uh, micro microbiome content and this detect. They also specifically look for antimicrobial resistant genes in the sh shotgun sequences. So what they found is that the sample indeed cluster based on the geographic origin of the flight and that there are higher proportion of antibiotics that are found uh, from it, on flights that are from South Asia, as, as shown in red here. Uh, and this indeed uh, hint at the, the fact that AMR genes could quickly spread around the world uh, through global travelers, and you'll learn more about these uh, type of analysis with Andrew later. Another study that I really like, and again, this is these are some older studies, but they're quite insightful in that they look at emerging diseases events that are defined uh, as the detection of newly evolved strains, so not just a strain that's been circulating. Uh, for a while, but uh, in the new strains such as COVID, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, or um, or the uh, uh, new strains of, of pox virus and so on. So uh, they looked at these emerging events in the past six uh, decades, 60 years, and noticed that there's an increasing trend uh, of all sorts of um, of pathogens that are emerging or re-emerging. And they also found that many of these human diseases are uh, or have zoonotic origins in identifying some global hotspots for these emerging infectious disease events. Uh, it's worth noting that one of the hot uh, spots is in the uh, Southeast Asia, where again, there seem to be uh, higher level of, of um, activities. And in, in the, a subsequent paper, in a subsequent paper, they then look at what are some of the risk factors associated with these events. And indeed, uh, tropical rain, being in tropical rainforest, higher, have a higher, having a higher population density or having a, a, a subtropical climate and also uh, a richness of in mammalian species are some of the uh, highly ranked risk factors. So uh, let's look at some of the notable outbreaks in the in the past uh, decade or so, um, and how genomic was used to understand the spread of diseases. So a decade ago, uh, it, some of you might have, might remember there was a the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in uh, in 2014. And that was one of the earlier outbreaks where uh, next generation sequencing data can be generated reliably and quite quickly in a research setting. So, um, so that's part of the reason I would like to highlight this particular outbreak. So the even though the uh, the virus never made it to our shore in, in Canada, uh, I was working in public health at the time and remember that there was significant uh, alert being placed and there's actually quite a few uh, mob activities to ensure that if, it, uh, if the viruses or, or cases or identified in Canada, there will be a, a rapid and uh, effective response. And 
back to this outbreak, uh, it was also significant in the sense that it did uh, cost uh, it, over 11,000 deaths in mostly in, in Africa and, and had a significant impact at that time on global travel as well, especially targeted um, uh, targeted uh, sanctions or, or um, barriers were put up against travel from in, uh, from these countries. So what you can see in this diagram is that the outbreak started as a single human exposure to, likely to a natural reservoir um, and not uh, due to repeat exposure. So there's, uh, um, and in once it's got into the human population, then is sustained by human to human transmission uh, due to the lack of public health measures and also the uh, practice, the local practice in terms of uh, burial and in terms of um, uh, the traditional healer based um, medical intervention. And when the disease spread from Guinea to Sierra Leone, uh, using genomic data, the researchers were also to, able to identify that there, even though it seemed like, a, again, a single event introduction, there are two distinct clusters as shown in, in this tree here that uh, end up in the Sierra Leone population. And this highlighted the potential that you know, the carrier could have a, a mixed population infection or carry two, sim two relatively similar strains of um, Ebola virus and that then um, independent, give in, independent branches in the, a, a new uh, population of host. So these uh, phylogenetic analysis uh, also help to Robberate with epidemiologic investigation to reveal the complex transmission dynamics, and also to apply uh, to supply healthcare workers uh, with more uh, I, to identify the transmission route and to institute more effective policies and interventions. Still, uh, there were delays of months and and to years for these type of analysis to become available, so this was not done in uh, real time. And another outbreak in uh, that is of note is the uh, Zika outbreak in America. So uh, Zika virus causes much more mild symptoms for most people and has been an endemic in Africa and in Asia for many, dec for many decades. And in 2015 and 2000 to 2016, it caused an outbreak in America. The outbreak resulted in a, in a few uh, thousand cases of microcephaly. And this is likely because the general population is naive to this virus. And uh, if you if uh, pregnant women caught the, vi caught the viruses at a specific time during the pregnancy, then it uh, uh, Effect the, can can have a, a lasting effect on the fetus, and apparently microcephalus is just one type of more severe form of the, of that uh, that effect. Uh, but there are um, many other um, long term impact on the health of of the infants when uh, the mother uh, were infected with Zika virus. So. Uh, the and but because the Zika virus symptoms overlap with other uh, viruses such as uh, dengue virus, surveillance that were in, based on the symptoms were not reliable because dengue virus was uh, endemic to the region already. So it's not until these cases that are starting to show up that uh, resulted in the the uh, resulted in investigation of of possible um, new viruses. So lab testing based on serology and molecular uh, analysis, including genomic analysis, when needed to confirm these uh, presence of, of the new uh, Zika virus. So they, because of the 
the delay in, in detection, the phylogenetic reconstructions of the cases also suggest that the viruses have, had indeed circulated in the population for at least a year before it was as noticed. And the data was used to also reconstruct the transmission route. Um, just want to highlight some of the uh, possibilities in, in how one can use high resolution sequence data for epidemiological investigation. So uh, gaps in surveillance efforts, uh, like the one I just described, increase the magnitude of the outbreak. And so the in introduction of viruses, when well, the new pathogen was not caught early. So, and this is especially an issue for mild diseases with non-distinct mild symptoms and, and rare severe symptoms. And if you think of Ebola versus Zika versus um, SARS-CoV-2, you can see it's generally true that our preventive measures is proportional to the severity of the diseases. And yet uh, for mild diseases with rare severe symptoms, both in the case of both Zika and uh, SARS-CoV-2, it still can have a large devastating impact on the general population. So genomic and molecular-based surveillance, um, our goal is to use it to reduce such gaps by focusing on understanding of the pathogens. And now I think all of you most likely have seen in the news of the avian flu and, and that's making the round in, in the news and how it has uh, been uh, hopping into new hosts and causing diseases. And my own sense is that this is most likely a tip of the iceberg that we are seeing and partly that we're seeing that now is not because these events have never happened before, but rather that these events are now being picked up because we are using genomic and molecular based assay to characterize the pathogens. Right? As I mentioned earlier, the emergence of new pathogens is not just defined as a, a complete new virus or new bacteria, but also the new variants of existing um, known pathogens. And what's uh, concerning is that um, the, if you look at how avian flu are transmitted globally, you can, they're basically through, uh, they're carried by wild waterfowls that are, that have overlapping flyways and as, as shown here. So, um, these are the different migratory path and zones where these uh, the migratory birds um, follow. And you, as you can see here, especially in Alaska, there's a, a crossover between the Asian uh, flyways and the North American and, and South American flyways. So in, um, in the case of, um, transmission of avian flus. Indeed, what we have been seeing is uh, the variations arise in Asia uh, gradually makes their way usually down the, the coast of um, Americas through this overlapping flyways. So influenza viruses have already caused hu four human pandemics and all these examples are uh, due to um, host hopping events in the past 100, 100 years. And pandemics uh, strains that are hyper, hyper virulent uh, usually arise from mixing of existing strains, either between human and animal uh, inf uh, influenza viruses or between animal influenza viruses, uh, very much what we're seeing now. And the, the overlapping pathways, uh, flyways, I should say, in the really uh, uh, raise the opportunities for these mixing events. The, uh, and as I mentioned already, the occasionally these viruses do hop over to other animals and to humans like we're seeing now. <coughs> Sorry. 
Okay, so we will also be touching on antimicrobial resistance in mobile genetic elements. So I want to highlight a study that's done a few years ago, uh, looking at why genomics, uh, or as an example, why genomic sequences can improve clinical microbiology. So many of the AMR genes are encoded in mobile genetic elements that can move from host to host, uh, different bacterial hosts. So the detection of these genes by PCR or the identification of the pathogens alone are not sufficient to establish the connections between uh, resistance and infection. So uh, this study highlighted how a tree that's constructed based on the genomics backbone or based on the, the common core genes of the, the different um, strains of bacteria uh, using specifically MLST, which you will you'll, uh, learn a bit more uh, about later on, and looking at the presence of various types of uh, AMR genes or ARGs, and also the different types of virulence factors, you can see that uh, just from the the randomness of the heat map here that the they're not uh, the the mobile genetic elements uh, has resulted in the distribution of these virulence factors and antimicrobial res resistant genes not following the uh, phylogenetic signals. Okay, and in my own group, we then got interested, not because of that paper per se, but just interested in general, how the, the different mobile elements or, or dendrograms, they're not, these are not, I should stress, not phylogenetic trees, but just dendrograms are generated from the presence or absence patterns of different mobile genetic elements, especially the ones that are of biological significance uh, compared to a tree that's generated from the core genes. And I'll describe what core versus accessory genes are, are a little bit later on. So here's a just a, a data from three different salmonella outbreaks. And they're happen, they happened in consecutive years in the same region. And what we did is we took the data and then uh, extracted variable regions uh, in these genomes, and then look, and then also label these various uh, variable regions by the type of mobile genetic elements that are in these regions. So the phage or genomic islands or plasmids or uh, CRISPR regions, and then compare it to a tree that's constructed based on core genes and based on uh, whole genome presence or absence of genes. As, and as you can see, all the methods were able to differentiate the outbreaks, which are the colored dots. So same outbreaks have the same color, and you can see that all the colors are grouping together. But if you look more closely, then the branching patterns between outbreaks uh, are different. So for example, in CGMOST, you can see uh, that the outbreak from 2012 and 2014 are grouped together. And, uh, but if you look at phage as an example, you can see two, uh, strains from 2013 outbreak and strains from 2012 outbreaks are clustering together. Um, so this is an example where it, not just the, the core genome and accessory genes have different uh, evolutionary histories, but also the combining of the two uh, in a systematic way may actually give you better predictions. So here's a, a, a graph showing uh, the monophyletic rate is just whether the outbreak strains are grouped together, like I've shown in, in this diagram before, or, or they're not based on each of these features. And CGMLST and WGMLST, which we'll learn later, are the common method used to uh, do molecular typing of pathogens. And what you can see here is that when we combine 
um, the CGMOST using this program called GG Caller. In other words, we, when we combine the core genomes and also the mobile elements, we actually get got slightly better prediction or congruencies between the dendrograms and the epidemiological investigated uh, or confirmed results. So in other words, the grouping of strains to the outbreaks um, was better when, when both the mobile elements and the core genes were taken into account. So moving on to uh, talk a little bit of, about COVID-19, although I think all of us probably want to put it behind us and 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 uh, have it as the it, have it in our rearview mirror in in the sense, but it indeed is a watershed moment in uh, genomic uh, use of genomic epidemiology in public health, and I would say it's the first time in human history that we actually are, were generating genomic data in real time to support public health decision making um, at a large scale. Of course, it's been done before at a, a much uh, smaller, especially research scale, but uh, this is sort of a, a really uh, a watershed moment where the, the scale up and the capacity building exercise that many of us went through uh, was un, unmatched by uh, in, uh, by the previous outbreaks that I demonstrated. So why do we want to sequence SARS-CoV-2 genomes? Um, the most obvious reason is for transmission tracking at all um, different geographic levels, so regional, provincial, national, or international levels. And as you can imagine, uh, transmission tracking at national international levels can only be truly effective when data is shared across the jurisdictional boundaries, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. It's also useful for cluster investigations uh, for, to, uh, for outbreak uh, studies and, uh, sorry, for outbreak investigations, uh, but also equally important beyond just the tracking uh, and the uh, public health epidemiological investigation, from a biological point of view, it's also important to understand the how the viruses are evolving and how these characteristics might impact the detection method, the clinical outcome. Um, uh, in other words, the disease severities and also uh, how it affect the transmission transmissibility of the the viruses. And the most reliable way to detect uh, the virus variants of concern is through uh, genomic sequencing. Um, and the um, result of that is also useful for uh, understanding the effectiveness of the healthcare measures, right? To see if indeed once we put in a measure, the a particular variant or a particular strain was um, uh, the prevalence or the uh, the prevalence of a particular strain then was reduced. It's also instrumental in informing treatment and vaccine development. And as we all know, the vaccine development have been tailored to the new strains as they uh, be uh, become dominant and to make sure that they elicit proper immune responses. So many national and continent Mental efforts to sequence the virus in close to real time uh, was, was the hallmark of the pandemic. However, some of um, these efforts had, are starting to be sunset. And in Canada, we actually are very interested in how do we leverage, in, in other places too, how do we leverage these capacities that were built up during the pandemic and use it for other disease surveillance rather than just sunsetting these efforts. So during the uh, pandemic, uh, under the, the leadership of uh, Genome Canada, and also uh, arranged through with, with uh, funding through with the federal government, uh, the Canadian COVID Genomics Network, or CanCoGen, was established in March 2020, and it reflected a, 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 two mil, a 20 million 
um, dollar investment for viral genomic sequencing and, and genomic capacity building in our public health uh, system, but also a $20 million human host genome sequencing for uh, of the infected individuals uh, for um, research to understand the host pathogen dynamics. The consortium uh, consists of both national and provincial public health laboratories, hospitals, research institute, large-scale genomic sequencing centers, especially for the host um, sequencing, but also industries and other coordinating centers. And the goal uh, at the time was was actually uh, what we thought was was a big goal was to sequence 150,000 viruses and 10,000 human, and also to uh, integrate the sequence data uh, through a data harmonization effort. And you'll hear more about that, I think, in in Emma's uh, lecture for um, to con connect the clinical IP data with the sequence data. And then we also uh, have a heavy emphasis on facilitating sharing of data nationally, internationally for, for these interventions. And lastly, building capacity, as I mentioned, to ensure that the genomic epidemiology can be carried out for future outbreak and pan pandemic preparedness. And we actually, so, uh, uh, su surpass our initial goal significantly. And actually, to date in Canada, there's more than half a million viral genomes sequenced. Uh, and this is, of course, not just with Cancogen funding, but also a lot of provincial and additional federal fundings that supported these data generation activities. And a few months after Cancogen started, or actually, I'd say a year or so after Kenkojin started, uh, the realization that the data need to be made available for data analysis resulted in the formation of a, a, a sub-project within Kenkojin called the Viruseq Data Portal that uh, became the public-facing or the open data repository for the Canadian virus genomic sequence data. And I just did the screen cap yesterday and there's five over uh, 570,000 genomes now on the website from various sources and the data and the metadata are all freely um, available for download and for analysis. And the paper as a preprint has finally came out after um, more than three years of effort from a large number of individuals. I think there's probably close to a thousand people named in the publication. Okay, so coming back to just give genomic epidemiology a definition after we saw a few of the examples. So, um, so first, I would simply say it's a com combination, uh, combining of whole genome sequence data from pathogens with epidemiological investigation to track the spread of infectious diseases. It's sort of the basic premise of genomic epidemiology, um, but I know uh, there are much more uh, robust and complex definitions out there, but I just want to have a general baseline for our discussion. Um, and Genomic epidemiology was driven by the fact that we can now generate sequence data at a much more rapid and cost-effective manner than we could uh, around uh, a decade or even two decades ago. So uh, the workflow is envisioned to be much more simplified where you can extract, you can get samples from in uh, individuals, could be a patient, could be an animal, and subject the samples to sequencing, whether through uh, isolation, so genomic sequencing, or through uh, enrichment, or even without enrichment, and do the whole metagenomic sequencing. And then from there, the readout would be sequences that then can be processed using bioinformatic tools, um, and that would lead, then lead to diagnostic prevention and treatment. So what we're learning in this workshop essentially is 
to unpack the activities that happen in this uh, sequencing and bioinformatic analysis stage. So there's some benefits and challenges associated with this process. One is that it's a much more simplified workflow than if you have to use different essays for different samples. It's also relatively fast turnaround time um, and it's only getting better as, um, and the, the sequencing time continue to be reduced and a lot of the effort now is trying to reduce the upstream sample processing uh, turnaround uh, or the, the amount of time needed for that. And also the reason why we're here is to reduce the turnaround time for the uh, the analysis of the sequence data. And this could be resulting cost saving by reducing the number of platforms or instruments that you will have in, uh, in the lab. And sequencing indeed has become commoditized. You can send your sequences to a uh, sorry, send your samples or DNA extract to a, a company and they'll sequence it for you. Um, the result of the sequences is also much more comparable and shareable than some other test data, such as post field gel electrophoresis. And lastly, uh, hopefully demonstrated in my earlier talk that there are a lot of value added analysis that you could do with the sequence data. The results, however, are harder to process and interpret, and the computational resource requirements will be higher, and often there was no in-house IT support for these type of computational resource requirements. And these are some of the things that you will see how we attempt to address them in this workshop. So uh, it's also, as I mentioned, rapidly changing technologies and adopting to, to these new technologies is not always easy when you're in an operational environment. Uh, the per sample cost is still higher than some other tests, so batch sequencing often is required. And there are other benefits and challenges encourage you to include uh, to continue to think about them and discuss them maybe on the on the slide in the slack channel. Okay, so very briefly, high throughput sequencing, I think many of you are aware is the uh, uh, it's both the next generation sequencing that we associate with Illumina uh, instruments and also third generation sequencing platform that gives you typically longer reads, such as the Oxford Nanopore or the, the PAC bio. And the sequence data have many uh, clinical and public health utilities, as I mentioned before. And these genomic data can be useful for also the value added analysis and especially in the research environment. And this is highlighting the importance of making sure these data are reusable. So I think in terms of sequencing technologies, uh, these are the common ones. And Sanger is still used uh, in many uh, operational environments in, in public health lab and in hospital labs and so on. Um, and, but gradually you're seeing the instruments such as the Nanopore or Illumina uh, replacing some of the uh, sequencing needs in these environments as well. And the one th that's common is this Gene Studio because it has a, a more streamlined workflow and somehow make it more suitable in a, a clinical environment. Although the instrument uh, the instrument operating cost is, is um, typically higher and also the, the results are not as um uh the what the, the instruments now is common in research so that the, the the workflows to process such data is also um mainly developed by uh the vendors rather than the, the research community and this is i think many of you probably have seen this diagram before but you can actually go to the uh genome.gov website and will show you how the cost of sequencing has dropped significantly over the the, the years. And um, 
right now estimate the draft bacterial genome can be generated between fifty to two hundred dollars, depending on your setup, um, and potentially cheaper too if you're just considering the sequencing cost. And I identify this paper that's actually quite useful from 2021 that lists the different short and long read sequencing instruments and how the accuracies and uh, the capacities compare to each other. So you can see uh, some of the, the matrix here. And of course, the nature of, of these instruments is that they do uh, evolve quite fast. So these figures, some of it uh, may have been outdated. For example, the um, uh, the uh, throughput of different instruments uh, usually grow year over year. So uh, this, but it's still relatively up to date and a good basis for your um, understanding of some of these sequencing instruments and their costs. So to summarize long versus short read sequencing, um, short reads are typically cheaper to, to generate and the instruments have higher capacity and throughput and also higher um, accuracy in, in general. So uh, the reads are consensus of many molecules. Um, so this is meaning that it's not a single molecular read. So what part of the accuracy actually came from the clones of reads that result in the amplification of the signals? Whereas long reads typically are called uh, single molecular sequencing, and it's looking at the signals or the uh, signals are coming from a single molecule, and the uh, the result of that is a, a lower accuracy of the of the data, so more likely to have base calling uh, errors, and also it has a lower generally lower capacity and throughput compared to the short read instruments. And they're still generally more expensive per base. However, one major advantage of long read sequencing is to be able to... Yeah. yeah. Question? No? Okay. Um, is to be able to... Uh, what happened to be able to uh, um, cross the or or to bridge the repeat sequence repeat repetitive regions in the genome. So if you um, if if you imagine each of these blue boxes, it's a repetitive sequence. When you have short reads that are shorter than each of these repetitive blocks, then when you uh, do assembly, which you'll we'll see uh, in Gary's lecture, um, what you might end up is that some of these reads will be collapsed, and as a result, you might get the wrong number of repeat units in the uh, consensus sequence or in the context. However, if you have long reads that each of these, on average, is longer than the repetitive regions, then you don't have that same problem because um, the you don't when you assemble these reads when you uh, link them together connect them connect the the overlap regions each of those already represent the full uh, length of the repetitive region so um, it doesn't result in this in the collapse of repetitive units in 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 these regions. The downside of long read that I mentioned is that uh, the error rate is, is slightly higher than, or in, in sometimes a lot higher than short reads. And here is the list of error rates uh, for the different instruments uh, for your reference. So to minimize the errors, the same region of the genome are typically sequenced multiple times. And this is what we call sequence depth coverage. So and the consensus then is used to correct the sequencing errors. Okay, now moving on to a bit about pathogen genomes, uh, so everyone's on the same uh, level. So bacteria 
are typically contained with the uh, genomes are typically contained within single circular chromosomes. Uh, there's some exceptions, some are linear. And what's important to also know is that it's a haploid genome, meaning that it only has one copy of the gene uh, and one copy of the chromosome rather than in human, for example, where diploids with two copies of a or two alleles of a given gene. And they may also contain extra chromosomal elements such as plasmids. And the genome sizes typically range from 0.5 megabase or well, 500,000 bases to could be over 10 megabases or you know, um, 10 million uh, bases. But on average, especially for pathogens, they're typically between three, I would say two to five megabases and contain about 3,000 to 5,000 genes per genome. Uh, viruses can be both DNA and RNA. And of course, I'm grossly simplified the biologies of these genomes. But as I mentioned, this is just to give everyone the same grounding. Um, so viruses can be DNA or RNA. They can be single strand or double strand. And they're classified into um, seven families. It's called the Baltimore classifications. And they also range from, they're much smaller than usually than bacterial genomes, one to two KBs to one to two megabases um, in size. And depending on, uh, they're depend dependent on whole cellular mechanisms for replication. Lastly, often neglected, neglected is the eukaryotic parasites. So these could be fungal, protists, or worms. And uh, they're usually a, a few to a few hundred megabases long. Uh, so they're larger than bacterial viruses and usually uh, are in multiple chromosomes. And again, um, because they're larger size and, and also the prevalence is lower, often there's, their genomes are much less uh, well studied than common bacterial and viral uh, pathogens. It's also important to realize that these organisms are highly dynamic and they're constantly evolving. So here's an example of a bacterial genome. Uh, and you can see that there's several modes of, of um, uh, operations in terms of changing the, the genome. So uh, an organism can go through gene loss with deletion and uh, end up with a smaller genome. We sort of call this sort of the lean and mean approach. They're highly specialized pathogens that may only uh, live in a certain niche, but they're highly adopted to that niche. And there's also cases where uh, uh, they're generalist pathogens that acquire new genes through horizontal gene transfer or go through rounds of gene duplications. And when you have gene duplications, then the second copy of that gene in theory can pick up a new function um, because it's no longer constrained by the original function that that particular gene carries. So uh, gene duplication and lateral gene transfer are ways for microbes and uh, some extent viruses to, to acquire new, uh, new, new functions and new genes. But also genome rearrangement is quite common in these organisms and through rearrangement, it could actually affect the gene expression and uh, in an unexpected way. So the uh, so this is explain why in you know we currently have more than half a million salmonella genomes and yet most of them are very different and uh, we have um, I think close to four hundred thousand E. coli genomes for the same reason we continue to generate these new uh, genomic sequences, yet we can't seem to capture the complete content of these pathogens, as I'll describe uh, in, a, in a bit. But coming back to the whole genome shotgun sequencing with NGS, the workflow is uh, depicted here. So you typically have isolates that you extract the DNA from, and then instead of cloning, you would amplify these segments through 
uh, P PCR and then just go straight on to sequencers and then followed by a readout. Uh, and then for uh, viruses, um, you can actually just, as we've seen in, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, amplify the whole genome through tiled amplification and then sequence the, the, the fragments to get the whole genome back. So sequence of data analysis, you'll see a lot more of this in, this in the next session, but essentially at the end of sequencing operation, you get millions of billions of partially overlap reads. And the goal here is to reconstitute the original genome from these millions of billions of, of reads. So this is the steps involved uh, uh, before you can do data analysis, which is to assemble the genome either by de novo assembly or by mapping to a reference genome. And once you have the reconstituted genome from your query uh, organisms, then you can also uh, start the annotation process and look then uh, looking at the functions of, of the genes that are found in these organisms. And lastly, you can look at um, the variations of your query organism or your study organism against references or someone else's uh, strings. Okay, and at the end of it, what you get are a set of contexts or contiguous sequences. Uh, and more and more so with long resequencing, the number of contexts can be quite small. And if you're lucky, you can actually reconstitute the whole chromosome as a single contig. And, um, but if you have gaps in your uh, genome, then typically you need to uh, carry out a finishing step by amplifying the gaps and then sequencing the gaps separately. And this could still be a time consuming process. And that explains why when you go into a public repository, most of the genomes uh, deposited there are in context, or in other words, in draft genomes where there are still gaps uh, present uh, in, the, in the genome that are not sequenced. Okay, so uh, genome annotation, the goal is to uh, identifying the genes location and function. Um, and one thing, one concept that you might want to be aware of is called the ab initio gene prediction. And this is basically looking at the coding sequence, uh, trying to identify the coding sequences by looking at the natures of these sequences. In other words, the frequency of, of ATC and Gs in a certain way, or the uh, certain words in the genome and compare uh, uh, so the computers are actually very good at identifying these coding regions uh, based on the differences in the four frequencies between coding and non-coding sequences. And this actually works very well for microbial genomes. So you end up with many, many predicted genes with unknown functions. And I know Gary will talk a lot more about functional prediction, so I'll just briefly by saying that uh, this is typically done through a process of sequence similarity search. And the result of matching your query sequence to a, another sequence with known functions in the database and then take the annotation of that gene in the database to be yours, in other words, making uh, the a function code based on similarity search is a process called transitive annotation. So you didn't actually study the function of your of your gene, but you merely uh, assume the function is the same based on a sequence similarity to another gene in the database. Uh, so this brings up an important concept of homology. So homology, again, you'll hear more in the phylogenetic lecture with uh, Fiona. So it's similarity due to shared common ancestry. So 
um, a pet peeve for mine is when people describe degrees of homology. Homology is strictly binary. So you either share a common ancestry or you don't. Um, so uh, we would say homology when we have enough evidence that these two genes indeed uh, share, uh, uh, have a same common ancestor. And orthologs are arise due to speciation, whereas paralogs are arise due to gene duplication, as you can see in the diagram here. So when you have a, two, a gene that's duplicated, then you have a gray and a white, uh, sorry, a gray and a black gene, they're called uh, paralogs. But the white gene and the gray gene are both coming from um, uh, uh, coming from this white gene. So these are um, ortho, uh, orthologs. Um, and here's another example of orthologs, right? But now imagine if in this organism, the black gene is lost, and in this organism, or sorry, uh, let's say the gray gene is lost, then it can create a confusion because the uh, gray gene and the black gene, stripe gene, are actually uh, by definition not um, orthogonous anymore, right? Because they're, um, sorry, yeah, they're not orthogonous anymore because they're a uh, result of a gene duplication event. So this kind of selected deletion of, of genes can lead to um, misinterpretation of, of phylogeny um, or the evolutionary relationship between these genes. And that makes uh, phylogenetic analysis um, difficult within microbial organisms. Um, and that also, uh, another effect is the transfer of genes through horizontal gene transfer or through these mobile elements from one organism to a, another unrelated organism. And again, when that happens, a, a false, um, uh, phylogeny could be uh, created. Okay, so uh, I will skip over this given time, but because, and I know Gary, uh, Gary would touch on BLAST search, but BLAST is one of the most common uh, sequence similarity search tools. And in this workshop, you'll actually see many other sequence similarity tools that are much faster and equally sensitive, or well, almost equally sensitive, but BLAST by far is the most uh, commonly used one. Okay, so I wanna to touch on concept of comparative genomics, which is the, um, uh, the, the analysis of, of genomes from the same species that are, um, uh, and, and to try to, understand the, the genomic variations between these two organisms. So for example, we might be interested to know why certain isolates of a pathogen are more resistant to antibiotics or more virulent compared to another strain. So this could um, give you some biological insights based on the, the gene content difference or the uh, within gene variations. We can also use these variations, as we've seen earlier, to track transmissions of pathogens. Um, so compared to genomics can be done at different levels. Uh, it could, you could be looking at regional variations, such as uh, results of, a, um, results of a, a chromosome recombination event and or the acquisition of, of uh, new plasmids and repetitive sequences that are found in the chromosomes. You can also, instead of looking at the uh, stretch of DNAs, both the coding and non-coding regions, also uh, focus on just looking at genes. And this is what we'll see when we do uh, MLST analysis, where we're looking at uh, gene by gene variations. And lastly, we could be looking at uh, variations at the nucleotide sequence uh, level 
and looking at either single nucleotide variations called SNFs or uh, looking at uh, short insertions and deletions in these uh, sequences as a way to, ident to identify variations across the different strains. So you might be curious, okay, it's when is the first uh, ba uh, bacterial comparative genomic paper published and what was it, what was done? So it turned out that it wasn't really that long ago, I guess two or two, 20, I guess, what, 25 years ago, um, uh, two helicobacter pylori genomes were sequenced and compared. And what was, uh, actually very interesting at that time anyway, was that uh, the variations of the genomes were actually concentrated in these blue regions with the rest of the genomes by and large uh, uh, conserved. So they, so these so-called strain-specific genes, the blue regions, seem to be located uh, within certain regions of the genomes rather than evenly spread across the genomes. And this provides very con concrete evidence that you know, these horizontal gene transfer acquisitions of the large stretch of DNAs could happen um, and vice versa. The reverse could also be true that the deletion of large scale fragments can also happen in genomes. So this is quickly reproduced in many other species and many other genomes uh, in uh, later on and gave to the idea, gave rise to the idea of these genomic islands or mobile genetic elements that uh, are uh, yeah, inserted into the chromosomes. And pangenome is the idea that when you compare many, many genomes, uh, you can then come up with a, rep a, a collection of genes that will be representative of that given species. So the term was first coined in 2005 in a paper by uh, Ted Leonard et al. And they essentially looked at six um, ruby strap genomes and then uh, used, the, used that information to, to see which genes are shared, which they then call the code, core genome, and which genes are strain specific, which they call the accessory genes. Um, and then from there, they made the observation that the core genomes typically are housekeeping genes where these strain-specific genes seem to have more adaptive functions or are corresponding to so-called lifestyle genes that are, more vari that are more variable. And it kind of makes sense now, right? The core genome has uh, essential functions are more stable and the accessory genes are ways for these organisms to innovate and Yet at that time, you know, that was a very uh, interesting and novel discovery and the term pangenome uh, stayed within the community to describe the uh, collection of genes that, uh, uh, for a given species of organism. The pangenome can also lead to a calculation to, you can extrapolate from what, from your data to see whether the theoretical number of genes uh, plateaus, uh, and in other words, if you, how many genomes do you need to sequence before you start seeing all the, the genes of a given species? So that lead, led to the idea of open versus closed pangenome. So when you have open pangenome, essentially it, the more genomes you sequence, the more genes you're going to, the more new genes for that given species you're going to identify. And organisms like E. coli and salmonella pretty much fall into that, those category, that, that category of open pen genomes. And some organisms like uh, uh, bacteria that cause anthrax or, um, uh, or the um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. These are organisms that seem to have a closed pen genome where after you sequence uh, a sufficient number of genomes, the number of new genes reduce drastically. It's rarely go down to zero, at least I haven't 
aware of organism where the the pen genome close pen genome is like guaranteed to have no genes to be found but uh no new genes to be found but um but the the it's a trending of the number of new genes found that give definition of these open versus closed pen genome okay for the last 10 minutes or so uh well six minutes i guess i'll go through the importance of um data, especially metadata sharing, and more of that will be discussed with, uh, with Emma. So the idea is that we have looked at how sequences can be generated and it's important for the analysis, but the interpretation of the sequences require you to have access to the metadata describing the samples or the they, uh, the clinical or epi data that describe the circumstance or the context of how these uh, genomes were uh, isolated and uh, and what type of um, samples did they come from. Equally important is the method that you use to process the, the samples and also the, the sequences can affect your interpretation. So if you use a method that, um, especially bioinformatics methods, notorious for generating inconsistent data, and um, we often would would try different method and see if they converge on the same answer, rather than just relying on a single tool to give you uh, the definitive answer, and that if you don't capture the information of how the data is processed and analyzed, then you could be comparing apple to orange when you're looking at the, the results. Um, and of course, the lab results is also uh, important to be captured in a, in a consistent and standardized format so you can compare the results across uh, institutions. So uh, it's not um, um, it, it's probably underappreciated how much uh, missing information is in our public repositories. So here's a study that looked at Gisette database. As many of you know, Gisette was the global database for um, SARS-CoV-2 genomes and also for uh, influenza genomes. That was, was what it was doing before SARS-CoV-2. And uh, it this study showed that the it's the incomplete metadata in these databases is quite rampant. So about sixty three percent of sequences missing basic demographic inf information of the the host, such as age and sex. Eighty four percent of sequences are missing sampling strategy, so it doesn't have the method described. And more than ninety five percent of sequences missing patient level clinical information. Um, and I'm quite proud to say that the virus seek data portal, the Canadian public repository, not only is it public and open, it also, we went through great effort to make sure that the basic metadata, uh, metadata or what we call the minimum metadata are present for all the samples. And when they're missing, there's specific code used to describe why the information is missing. Um, so it represents a lot higher quality metadata than the global repository. And there are indeed some challenges sharing data across Canada, especially at the early days of the pandemic. And it's still an ongoing issue due to the fact we have 14 different healthcare systems and there's no universal standard for data collection and sharing. And also there's no uh, legally binding public health data sharing agreement in Canada. So a lot of the uh, data is shared, uh, I don't want to say just good, based on goodwill, but it certainly is shared when, uh, or based on uh, MOUs and, and other uh, documents that are, um, that are generated based on the goodwill of, of these organizations that are working together um, rather than based on a def 
de facto or default uh, data sharing agreement. Although a lot of work is now being done in this area to try to bridge that gap. And the restricted flow of patient data across Canada can be, I would argue, is a violation of the universality and portability of our healthcare, right? So when you move provinces, a lot of time your healthcare data actually doesn't follow you, at least in a not in a seamless way. So it's an issue that um, as Canadians, we do need to uh, address and look seriously to make sure that these data are being put to best use to support healthcare and also to support, I, I would argue equally importantly, uh, healthcare research so we can do better next time. Uh, a, a health event or public health event happens. So during the pandemic in collaboration as part of Ken uh, we also worked with, with, uh, with others, uh, ethicists, legal experts, so on and so forth, on uh, some of the uh, challenges associated with data sharing, such as privacy concerns and also the public opinion, are people pro-sharing or are people against sharing of, of data? And it's quite um, uh, nice to see that by and large Canadians are actually quite willing to share de-identified uh, COVID data uh, with health researchers in order to improve um, the uh, our knowledge of and, and also our ability to respond to uh, pandemic events and, and other health events. So uh, I don't have time to go to go through this, but this is published uh, in um, here's the the link here, the BMC Open uh, last year. Okay, so I just want to end with couple of slides to get you to think and, you know, AI and large language models and all these sort of buzzwords, but I want to get people to think about, you know, the general process of training an AI model involve getting uh, label data, and then you train the AI model based on the data, and then you deploy the models to uh, whatever tasks that you uh, uh, want the, the AI to do. Right, be it generate a, a picture for you or or write a your essay for you or whatever, right? But in our world of genomic epidemiology, that label data is often missing, as I've just shown you, right? The 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 metadata is missing, so you can't really label the sequence data properly to do these uh subsequent steps. So that's why I'm highlighting the importance of having these contextual information. So if you really want to realize the uh, AI research or, or other kind of machine learning research for uh, infectious disease, uh, and, and now we're generating a lot of genomic data to enable us to do so, uh, having label data is the key challenge here. So the take home message for you is pathogen genomic sequence data provide valuable information for infectious disease epidemiological investigations. While there are a wealth of microbial and viral genomic sequence data, the contextual information needed to make the data valuable for analyzed, ana sorry, for analysis and reanalysis is severely lacking. And we need to change the metadata sharing practice of the microbial genomic community so we can bring the sequence and the contextual data together and to work together to solve um, infectious disease challenges. So I hope you enjoyed the rest of the workshop and learn a lot more about how you would do these type of work um, that I just described to you. Thank you.